who is poetess. This whole day is going to be filled with gratitude and poetry. Two of my favorite, favorite things. And I want to, before we even go any further, I have to also say Les Bernstein is amazing in organizing us and getting the word out and sharing the wisdom she has learned over all the years she's been writing poetry. And thank you so much for being part of our board. <laughs> Nothing happens by accident. We're here because we have a common interest in writing, in sharing, and in supporting one another. Redwood Writers is an amazing organization. I came to it about seven years ago because I learned of all of the value of being in a community of writers. Writing can be a solitary practice, yet when we share our work, when we publish, either by speaking, reading, or writing, that's when the magic happens. And all of you are magicians. So let's create a very special day. It's beautiful, it's spring. Oh my goodness, I cannot tell you. Just coming here, I live in Sonoma. So my, I have several different, I have three different routes I can take to get to the Finley Center. And today I took one that took me through all of the mustard fields through Petaluma. Oh, it is amazing, it's wonderful, it's uplifting, it's a resurgence. And just like the plants, Redwood Writers coming together in person is just like that. What is happening here at Redwood Writers is truly magical. We have speakers lined up. We've got workshops coming on board. Today we're going to be honoring the winners of the poetry contest. And you're going to be learning about some of the new initiatives coming after that. So I just want to give you a little taste of what is happening. Today, the Poetry Celebration, a very special award which will continue to honor Fran. And we have the 10 minute play contest. Oh my goodness, you have until nine o'clock tonight. <laughs> until nine o'clock tonight. If you haven't quite gotten your play done, you can still get it done and get it in there. Our 10 minute play contest will close and then they'll be performing those plays in June and we have Hillary Moore here from off the page Readers Theater who is the organizer of the performances and we're very privileged because of that we are going to be announcing the winners of the play contest in May at our meeting and May is a very special time, too, because Mara, would you just stand up for a second? She's going to make an announcement a little bit later. But Mara is our Prose Anthology Chair this year, and we're going to be doing something very different. <laughs> later today, I believe you'll be able to um, see all the goodies about the Prose Anthology and how to enter that. And I want you to be thinking... Now, you know, we're doing a celebration today. I want you to be thinking about who you might nominate for the Jack London Award. No? I can't tell them about that? It's a board decision. It's a board decision. A board decision. But we still want to... <laughs> but, 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 we want to know your input. We want to know if you think there's someone who has done outstanding service for the club who has not already been honored for that award. You can speak to any of 
the board members. And I want the board members who are present to please stand up. This is our volunteer cast of characters who puts this group together, who supports you so that you can shine. And you'll be hearing more about the board elections, which will be happening next month. You're going to hear a slate, and then we will install the new officers, as well as some additional folks who might want to participate on the board. Okay, let's see. I'm going to save the other announcements about the club activities until afterwards because I want to get started with our celebration for Fran. And Les, I'm going to introduce you first and then I'll... Don't, don't, no, you're supposed to. You want me to go ahead and do it? Okay. As, as written. I just want to be sure. <laughs> and with that, I am going to tell you a little bit about Fran. Now, I could be up here for three hours or more telling you about Fran, but I'm going to tell you just a bit. So, Fran Claggett Holland has a generosity of spirit. It is apparently shared in all the lucky people she has mentored over a very long life. She's the embodiment of contribution. Her poetry speaks directly to the many lives of the heart. The poems are landscaped with spirits traveling both inner and outer worlds. It is the poetry of myth and subconscious. Her life is an epic poem containing a clear-eyed history. Being with Fran reveals introductions, I'm sorry, reveals instructions how to dwell inside a body and celebrate the music of ordinary life. Though her poems are filled with remembrance and transcendence, she always knows her way home. In his later years, Stanley Kunitz wrote, I can scarcely wait till tomorrow when new life begins for me as it does every day, as it does every day. Fran exudes this remarkable spirit and it is present in her poetry. Simply put, Fran Claggett Holland is a magician and a masterful poet. For those of you who don't know Fran's history, let me tell you a little bit more. She lives in Sebastopol with her Saluki and Whippet. <laughs> Poet, writer, and teacher. She currently teaches memoir writing and poetry for the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Sonoma State University. She's been a student of Ollie, Cor of Ollie courses since their inception, and she's a member of the faculty for about 12 years and a member, formerly chair, of the Curriculum Committee. She's a strong proponent of OLLI as it was first conceived and has taken many OLLI-sponsored trips. She's an active member of the OLLI Art Group and of Redwood Writers. She began writing back with the Bay Area Writing Project Fellow. I'm sorry, Fran is a Bay Area Writing Project Fellow. She taught at Alameda High School for many years, and her spouse, Madge Holland, team taught the first humanities courses for high school students in California. Since her so-called retirement, yeah, we know about <laughs> retirement around here, Fran has been writing books for teachers, and in addition, she's worked with the California Curriculum Study Commission, the National Council on Education, and, econ and the economy, and given workshops for teachers from Alaska to Hawaii to Florida and many places in between. 
She was the chief architect of the class statewide assessment of writing and reading in California. Now, this I think you're going to find particularly interesting. Her interest in brain research led her to develop approaches to reading, writing, and thinking using metaphorical graphics and resulting in her first book for teachers, Drawing Your Own Conclusions. She's written several other books for teachers and most recently completed the seven book textbook series of Daybooks of Critical Reading and Writing with Luann Reed of Colorado State University and Ruth Vince of Columbia University. Well, Franz won a boatload of awards for teaching, for writing, and all the way through this, she's maintained this generous spirit and the wish for all of us to express ourselves. Okay. Her latest book is Moments with Madge, Lux Alterni Alterna. It's a combination of poetry, memoir, and art, and proceeds going to the series project with the proceeds going to the series project, as did the proceeds from Crow Crossings. The Moments book celebrates Madge and Franz's 54 year life together. Okay, I can't even catch up to that. I'm at 42 with my husband. So Fran was a high school and college English teacher. She teaches at the OLLI program at Sonoma State University. She's a poet, a consultant, and a writer. She's a frequent presenter at state and national conferences. She pioneered the use of metaphorical graphics in teaching and of writing and literature. And today, we are honoring you, Fran, for your contributions, not only to us, but to the world. And I just feel very honored to be part of this community and to honor you. Do you want to read the award? And then can you hold the award yeah, up? Can you hold the award up? Thank you. You want to read the award? Yeah. They will. The award says, honoring Fran Claggett Holland <coughs> with the Fran Claggett Holland Award in recognition of an outstanding member who inspires and lives the club's vision. Writers helping writers. Thank you. My, my primary goal in life has always been to help others achieve their own writing dreams. And we all dream together. Thank you. Yes. over to Les. <laughs> um, first of all, I wanted to say how thrilled I am to be able to see Fran get this award. It's not just an award for this year. This is an award that will be given from time to time in Fran's name. So it will exist for people who have made a remarkable contribution to writers helping writers. So there you go. So we have a surprise for you, Fran, and it's a big one. And Robin's going to come up, and she is going to present you with it. And it would be great if we can get you in your walker so that you can get a picture of you getting this award. So, yes. So, one, 
come on up, Robin, and you come on up too. I want you up there. Yeah, I want you up there. Get up. Okay. <laughs> Man. Fran and Robin at the mic. And, um, <laughs> so, Fran, um, I'm very pleased to present you with this card of congratulations made out to you. And I'll just read it for the benefit of the audience. It's from the United States Poet Laureate Ada Lamon. <laughs> and she says, Fran Clagett Holland, congratulations on all your years of writing poetry and in service of poetry. The establishment of this award in your honor speaks to your generosity, your talent, and your grace. Please accept my heartfelt congratulations on this Lifetime Achievement Award. With my respect and admiration, Ada Limon, 24th Poet Laureate of the United States, oh. April 2023. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now you can go back and sit down. <laughs> Still less Bernstein. <laughs> Transformed by their experience of knowing Fran. And um, we're going to start with Steve Trennan, who, has a, who had a lunch with Fran, and that lunch with Fran resulted in this most beautiful poem. So, Steve, come on up. Go ahead. Les Bernstein once said to me, there is someone you should meet. I think you will like one another. So I knock on Fran's door, and as it opens, it transforms itself into the cover of Vogue magazine. I am confronted by a bejeweled, elegant woman with Christian Dior dogs on either side of her. <laughs> Cut on the bias like the exquisite dress she is wearing. She has made an impression without uttering a word. It turns out, beauty has no age requirement. The poem I am about to read was gleaned from our luncheon together, as well as my reading of her poems. And its title is a line from one of her only sons. It is called, At the Far End of a Sturdy Branch. You, who knew Robert Frost and bought a Picasso with money you didn't have. Now greet me at your door with a saluki and a whippet in a dress windswept with charcoal brushstrokes, a necklace which only your neck could honor, and a smile to welcome me in. The house brims with art. A collusion of couches and chairs brace themselves to accommodate an entire tribe of poets. The butcher block scored with decades of Madge's slices in concert with flour from your hands. As you speak of your, own, your two only sons, both poets grown gray, and Madge behind a permeable membrane of memory, I hear the music of the end of your beginning, measuring out the days grounded in rhythm and rhyme. At one point, I envision you holding a cup of hot chocolate, marshmallows melting on the surface, afloat on the second movement of Beethoven's Patatik. While you leave a lifetime of astonished poets in your wake, every encounter 
a potential student. I catch a glimpse of what my life could have been and might still become. Our next reader is Linda Reed. And um, when I call your name, just start making your way if you're all the way in the back. I just want to say um, that uh, uh, Fran has uh, been a mentor. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm very emotional. I'm going to get through this. Okay, <laughs> Fran has been a mentor to so many, and she's certainly been a mentor to me. I would not be teaching at um, Ollie at SSU or Dominican without Fran. Um, I would not be in a fabulous uh, poetry group of amazing poets without Fran. And um, she believes in me and has believed in me and has supported me. And I, I remember when I went to her, I met her when I went to a memoir class. She was teaching at Ollie. And she asked me to read my memoir, and I shook so hard that my knees knocked. I found out what that meant. Your knees actually can knock. And, <laughs> and, and when the class was over, she asked me if I'd like to be in a critique group with her. And I went, I, I was, I, I said, oh, that would be nice. And then I raced home. I ran home. And I ran in the door and I said, Harry, Harry, Fran Claggett wants to be in a critique group with me. You know. So, yeah. So, anyway, um, she uh, has helped me with my poetry. Uh, whenever I have a poem that's scaring me to death, something that I have to do, it goes to Fran first. And she looks at it. And then she tells me, uh, good or bad, or what to, what to do. So, I really, I love you. Okay, my poem is called Exact Right Life. A strangeness stalks me the first time in forever. I think of something dropped into the dark, maybe even into Plato's cave or perhaps into my own mind. I believe there is more. I want the corners of my life to turn pink as I go into the sunset. I want my dyed blonde hair not to fall out before I make it to the end. <laughs> Somewhere between tears and coffee, I need to find the exact life. To fly toward the sun, to hell with waxed wings, to let the cup spill, the juice stain. I want to draw, draw, I want to drown in endorphins. I need to see myself to know these last years are right. Taste the morning blue of the sky. Love my one life. Oh, and did I say, I'm coming back. <laughs> famous duo of Joanne Smith and Gail Kissin. Here they come. <laughs> I'm one of those uh, st still um, never quite sure to call myself a poet, but uh, Fran is one of those people I actually was reading in one of her books last night, and I had the opportunity to to write something that went on, on one of the little blurbs, and it and it said it has li quite literally changed my life. And I, I'll bet some of you feel that way too. That to encounter someone as giving as Fran is is just uh, one of the life changing pieces of my life. In 2018, I had been in Fran, Fran's uh, poetry group for one year, and, um, and there was an ekphrastic poetry event that was happening um, with the Sebastopol Center for the Arts. And we were, as poets, assigned a piece of art. And at that time, I didn't even know what the word ekphrastic meant, but uh, I was assigned this piece of art which, for those of you who have been in Fran's home, know that that is the Picasso that Steve referenced in his beautiful poem. I sat uh, 
on a sofa. We all, you know how we all kind of, we find a seat and then it sort of becomes our seat. And my seat was directly uh, in front of this piece of art. And I shuddered every time uh, there was some movement that could have um, threatened that piece of art. Well, you know, it's one of those crazy things about life. I was assigned that piece of art to write a poem. And that's the one I'm going to share because um, it'll always be friend to me. It'll always be that poetry room. It'll always be that place and that uh, intimidation and exhilaration that is um, <coughs> so much a part of that room. This is an ekphrastic poem called The Bearded Man's Wife. Uh, it is a, a based on a, a ewer, a, a vase of Pablo Picasso. There were 500 and Fran has one of the 500 in her room. I don't know if you can see it, but maybe we can pass it around. Or it is important. I've learned with ekphrastic art that if you don't have somehow have a reference to the piece of art, it, it's very difficult sometimes to, to capture. If I gazed at your face 500 times, I might not see the mystery there behind your blank, expressionless stare, or would I? The brushed, irregular glaze of your face, stained perhaps by tears, like the one about to fall from your eye, bears no resemblance to your more vivid mate, the eponymous bearded man. His masculine face, a rich, smooth bronze, expressive, decidedly dominant. Your hair hangs loosely on the left, tightly braided on the right, held back with adorning ribbons and bows, a whimsical leaning. Yet how to know your nature, whether careless or contained? Who were you? Why is your face frozen in anonymity? Were you a woman of substance, a vessel of life, more than the bearded man's wife? The multidimensional ewer of you, the curves and dips and depths of the white earth and clay, reveal as a flat, plain mask. Your eyes, if not frightened, lack passion, as if they see nothing, as if you were to yourself invisible. I could see your face 500 times more to explore what Picasso ignored. A plainly exposed misogynist, he captured your beauty. It was all that he saw. Whether lapse or intention, your dimension was sadly dismissed. You should have been painted with awe. Robin Gabbard will be next. And I, I was told to say who's going to follow. So, Scott, you're after. Grant. Bless me. Oh, excuse me. Gail has a poem that she'd like to read. I thought you were just the visual. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll listen with all. Go for it. Gail Kissen. Friend and neighbor of Fran Claggett. I um, <coughs> tossed a couple of lines at Fran, <laughs> and um, with her own eye and hand and fairy magic, it bloomed into this poem that is what Fran and Les call a braided poem, although. I know that braids are actually three parts, but far, far be it from me to argue with the masters. <laughs> the listener's the third part. <laughs> okay. See? Still teaches. <laughs> Meditation on my discomfort, a dialogue. Pinned by circumstance, power drains to nowhere. Love so pure and deep 
embroiled where it does not belong. Momentarily suspended, unsure in this land of nowhere, sometimes wandering into the questionable. Riding the tidal waves on words that flow into a watery thesaurus of language, it looks for vision from the crest. Patient in its true nature, rumbling like a slow groaning bumblebee, searching for the wisdom of water. Robin Gabbard. <laughs> Hi all, Robin again. Um, I, Fran spoke to me before I ever met her. I heard her poetic voice and I had written a small poem for her. And so I, I took it over to her. It was sort of, it started out as a haiku. And this haiku has now evolved into a haiku plus a tonka, and now more of a, a poem that's a longer length. So I'm going to read that for you now. It's called Ravenwood for Fran Claggett Holland. Rings of the Redwood wish for her words to reflect their living legend. A raven eye glistens in the moonlight, then winks at the woman who watches from her desk. She smiles, then writes. In that moment, two souls merge. What was dark has been illuminated, burls smoothed, caressed until all words meld into a silken potion, stirred into a perfect poem, giving wings to a love never lost, lift to, lift to wings that will always fly. Sky Blaine is next. I blame. I met Fran about seven years ago, and it's right after I uh, took the volunteer position of overseeing the poetry column in the Redwood Writers newsletter. And I went over with poems that had been submitted because I was fairly new to poetry, and I wanted Fran to review these poems, and we could talk about them and make sure that my sense was appropriate. The first thing that happened was I walked in the door and she said, do you like dogs? And I said, <laughs> yes. So she let her dogs out and they were a saluki and a whippet and I've had wolfhounds and deerhounds and now salukis and so we share a great love of sighthounds. And that day she invited me to join her poetry group and I, I was stunned. I had no idea what she saw, but I am a poet because of Fran. And I, I'm just grateful to the bottom of my toes, so thank you, Fran. This poem is about writing poetry, and it's called Need. What I need to write a poem. First light brightening the east before dawn lazes over the field. A door to close my mocha within reach. Wide expanse of computer monitor with its lovely white page, calling, calling, begging for words. No journal and pen for me, the endless crossouts that force rewriting just to make it legible. I choose cursor and backspace, cut, copy, or paste, swipe and delete and ergonomic keyboard so my arms don't ache. And the light, the lovely light, birthing a fresh day, opening the way for words, still, deep quiet settling around me. An empty calendar helps. Too much pressure and words flee to find you, lucky you, happy with pen and paper. <laughs> I 
our next reader is Judy Beck. I had written a lot of poetry when I was a teen. And then unfortunately, when I went to college, I took a creative writing class and was told I couldn't write. <laughs> and so I didn't for a very long time. And then I came back and I joined Redwood Writers. And I hadn't done poetry, I mean, seriously, in about 40 years. But there was a poetry contest, and there was an anthology. I said, well, what the heck, I'll give it a shot. Never thinking I'd be accepted, never thinking it would be seen by anybody but me. And I got my first poem in a Redwood Writers anthology. And that was because Fran was willing to edit our poems. And a light came back on for me. So the poem I'm going to read you kind of weaves a story about something that is very meaningful to me and I hope it'll be meaningful to you as well, because poetry, poetry really does flow through our veins if we only listen. Out of Oz, scanning, searching for a sign. Somewhere over the rainbow, Slides into my ears, infuses my heart, my song. Honeyed jazz tones interpreted by a gorgeous woman, bedecked in a snazzy straw hat. Her timeless silhouette echoes ambient melodies lingering, the impression left behind by the musician. A subtle elegance, like a hint of perfume the subject of a previous portrait session ties us, unites us, in Lori B's light-filled studio. The music offers comfort and joy tinged with sadness. Calling out this song is mine, rendered by my namesake, the girl in pigtails, gingham, Ruby slippers, annual holiday tradition, grainy black and white celluloid, gives way rainbow colors popping our eyes, no longer in Kansas. In our new world, the hero is a heroine. Precursor to Amanda Gorman in a yellow coat, the innocent girl on her journey out of Oz, finding courage on her way back home, gifted, guided, by a little help from friends. My heart opens in surprise, absorbing my, king, my keepsake song at a survivor celebration, foreshadowing my own survivor's dinner down the road. I'm hugged by pure sweet acapella notes vocalizing happy, sad tears for fallen friends. My healing soundtrack, a disparate blend of styles, Garland's cinematic innocence, Cassidy's soaring sweetness, Willie's gravel interpretation. My over the rainbow kit filled with CDs and MP3s, lyrics etched into my heart. Happy, sad, the song reels me in. I'm a kid again, eager to begin again. Gliding over my rainbow, birds vocalize sweet promises, populate the air as they glide, soaring, arching with careful abandon, lilting melodies of grace, time and space, rippling beneath the sun. Entwined soloist sky dance, elegant aerialists, joyous hearts, emerald iridescent refraction, shadowed wings, remembrance, 
and promise. Abby B, you're up next. Hi, Roger. Good. Abby Bogomolny. <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> Took me uh, forever. To <laughs> anyway, oh, Fran, I love you. Fran nurtures. She encourages. She finds the goodness in us and turns up the volume. Um, when I walked into the writing group in her room, the living room, I felt like I was back at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City or the, or the Mama Museum. And uh, I just I said, I'm home. So um, without Fran, I wouldn't have been able to write up a, a positive poem like this one. <laughs> it's called Imagine. <laughs> Imagine waking up, knocking and hissing. You could rise like steam, straining pipes to the first, then second floor. You could sputter multiple languages and be called brilliant. Or you could just lie in bed, look around the room in the dark, unable to change your grainy swordfish night. If all the hoopla seems to belong to others, friends, laughter, fun you missed, maybe it's because your prime time sits at the end of another afternoon. When the pale sun rises, one moment is all it takes to use your treasure. Rise. <laughs> so Laura Blatt will be reading next, and after Laura, we're going to have Barbara Armstrong. So Barbara, start getting up now. <laughs> Short people have to adjust. I'm Laura Blatt. Um, I met Fran because I took her um, Oli class, her memoir class, which I really enjoyed. And after that, I too, like Linda, was um, told, gee, would you like to join my, <laughs> my writing group, my critique group? And this, this was quite a few years ago, and it was a critique group for prose and memoir and poetry and whatever, and over the years it has met at, mainly at Fran's house, which would be really lovely, and we'd have tea, and it would be at Linda's house, and it would be at various people's house and houses, and then it was over at the uh, sitting room in Pengrove, and then it's evolved back and turned into a lovely focused poetry group. <laughs> um, and, yeah, and Fran, thank you. And thank you for the mentoring over the years and the critiques. Um, and I wouldn't be writing if I hadn't been invited to that memoir group, I'm sure. Uh, my poem today, come, I wrote recently, well, from walking through the woods, and I think Fran would appreciate that it does have a crow in it. <laughs> <laughs> this is called Beyond My Voice. Words wrap around my mind, drum loudly in my head, like a pileated woodpecker hammering holes in bark. But no rhyme or rhythm comes as clear as walks through woodland or the pelt and fury of rain. I toss stones in Asbury Creek, wander among wildflowers and coyote, coyote brush. Two red-tailed hawks mate and common crows take flight. 
creatures come and go beyond my voice, obeying only spring. <laughs> So now, <laughs> good job! It, it's Barbara Armstrong, and after Barbara reads, Linda Stamps is going to read, and then Jean Wong is going to read. Okay. <laughs> I've known Fran a very long time, and um, poetry has always been central to our uh, relationship with each other, and her uh, support and not just for me, but for so many people, has meant so much. Uh, thank you, Fran. Thank you for being there for all of us. I was looking for a poem in my collection um, that Fran might appreciate, and so I chose one that had a bird in it, because uh, she's very fond of birds and has an affinity for that particular um, group of animals. And uh, it also has a piano in it, because Fran used to play the piano and um, did Bach and uh, Mozart. And, um, and it also has the uh, left and right side of the brain, because uh, Fran understands that as well and uses both. <laughs> uh, and beyond that, um, the message is that um, even in ordinary things, there can be an unexpected magic, and I think um, Fran has brought that out in so many of us. It's called To Capture a Roadrunner. Oh, by the way, I'm Barbara Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little slow on the draw here. <laughs> to Capture a Roadrunner. You could get up at daybreak, pack the pockets of your khaki vest with pencils, sketch pad, a field guide from Audubon with facts and colored plates, strap on a backpack and drape from your neck a four-star camera with a telephoto lens. Or you could stay home wrapped in yesterday's pajamas, open the sliding door, settle at your piano keyboard as empty spaces open up in both your hemispheres, initiate a melody from deep within, unrehearsed and free of expectation. A hybrid blend of Bach etudes with fickle interludes of Amadeus and Nouveau Sarat. Play it soft and easy, the way you like to do, so as not to undermine the desert quietude. In time, you feel a subtle shift, sense a wild presence lingering, tail feathers on alert, top knot slightly at a tilt, your image is held captive in a jeweled, glistening eye. That elusive bird you saw it is standing at your threshold looking in. Not a piece of common yard art or some lightweight feather duster, but a curious, warm-blooded creature like yourself, a sentient spirit with an earnest ear for music. <laughs> Our next reader is Linda Stamps. Linda Stamps. Fellow poets and writers, I'm here today to preach the gospel of Fran Claggett. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get an amen? Amen! amen. Hallelujah! <laughs> if I don't do that, I'm just going to blubber and cry, so bear with me. Um, I am have been blessed too to be in, a, in one of Fran's groups. It's the Blue Moon Salon in that den with the dogs and those wonderful poets. And I met Fran at a Redwood Writers event and ended up in the group. Last poem I wrote before that time, which was about five, six years ago, was I was 12 years old and I had a crush on a girl in my science class. And I wrote this poem, and I was moving or cleaning out years and years later, and I read it, and I thought, oh, my God, I'm sticking to fiction. <laughs> Anyhow, Fran has three words she uses when she gentles us and nurtures us through the critiques of our poems as we progress. And those words are just a thought. <laughs> and, and they're beautiful. 
they're beautiful. They open the world to possibility for those of us as we evolve as poets. So I wrote a poem entitled Just a Thought, and it's in two parts. One, insert, remove, replace, revise. Words clicked, snapped, placed, know, <coughs> listen, dream space. So gentle this crow circling above what's possible, form unearthed. Meter and rhyme, slanted or not, a door opens, words pulse. Phrases and stanza, sorrow and beauty, darkness and light, shadows reverse. Her fledglings flit and flutter, take flight. She smiles, knowing it begins. Two. The poet's poet nudges and mentors, unearths the moments, the consciousness of stone. To her once fledglings, she offers just a thought as they hover above each draft in search of the perfect word, the measured meter. Her guidance evidence in the pursuit of poetry's alchemy. Wong is going to read next, and then we have <coughs> Betty Less. So, with all the accolades of a friend, of course, I've been in her writing group too. And um, my brother used to be a magician, and I always thought of um, being in Fran's classes, uh, going to a magic show. Because if uh, any of you have been in a critique group, uh, you know what it's like when someone says, well, um, that metaphor seemed um, a little obscure, and it, it, it didn't, didn't do much for me. And somebody else would say, well, I, I think it's perfect. I, I think it's original. And um, a friend would pop up, you know, in our critique group, and she would, and, and we would be kind of going back and forth and back and forth, and she would say, well, um, how about if you use the second line of the fourth stanza for the title, and then switch the last stanza to the first stanza, and then put the fourth line for the third stanza as the last line. <laughs> and everybody would go, yeah. <laughs> That works. <laughs> no argument. Um, I'm going to be reading um, a poem uh, for Margaret Rooney. Uh, the, uh, if you know her, the in incomparable Margaret Rooney, uh, who lives out of town and, and can't be here, but she's thrilled to have her poem here for Fran. In this circle. From its perch, the yellow bird summons dawn note by note, like a town lute player. Day blind stars fade from the window, and morning arrives thin as worn fabric. In soft lit air, your breath sounds like the whisper of a sea in a shell. Mist moves in willows like smoke. Across the valley, there's the suggestion of rain in low blue-bellied clouds. The world with its ruptures and raptures, its dissolutions and resolutions calls me into this moment. Alive for now in this bend of time, no longer edgewise to earth. Your thigh beneath my palm, warm as hot sand. In all possible multiverses, this is the iteration I love. You curled beside me, casting a spell of home. And then from the sublime to the slightly ridiculous, um, I have a poem written um, called On Poetry. 
I hate writing poetry. <laughs> I come from a generation of farmers. My DNA is about survival, whether there's rice in the cupboard or water in the well. Reading a poem is intolerable. Writing one is torture. What's the point? Why can't we just talk to each other? There's not much happening in my life. I think about things like what I'm having for dinner or my checking account balance. Why would I write about an idea I don't have? Daffodils are bland. Blackbird's scary. The summer day's too hot. Forget the red wheelbarrow. <laughs> I have nothing to say about the bell and the owl. I know the world sucks, but a poem makes it worse. <laughs> Why can't I use words like thing, anyhow, or really? Why do I have to sneak around with my thesaurus pretending big words are part of my vocabulary? <laughs> Who cares if there's an internal rhyme or metaphor? What's wrong with the true, tried and true cliche? <laughs> Save me from the villanelle or haiku. <laughs> Why am I in a poetry group? I still can't answer that question. You can find yourself in jail for 20 years without even committing a crime. <laughs> Please don't make me write a poem. Something about a wall is just not for me. Okay. Betty Less. Roger. Good. Betty Less. I don't really have any prepared <coughs> remarks except underscore what everyone has said. Uh, I moved out to California from Wisconsin about 12 years ago, and I met Fran, and that was the luckiest day of my life. It was divine intervention. I wouldn't have become a poet if it weren't for Fran. So thank you so much. This poem is about stone, or rocks as I call them, and it's about time. It's called What is Time to a Rock? What is time to a rock, rock that mantled the earth while oceans rose and fell and continents skated apart? I ponder this question, walking the beach at low tide, coming face to face with just such a rock. Feet sink into wet sand, fingertips trace the intricate layers and folds that hold its story. How it was formed, what it beheld, the great grinding and pushing that thrusted up on this shore. I think about my life, the tiny blip of it, try to imagine millions and billions of years passing, touch the rock in reassurance that such a span is possible. I ask it, was time long? Did it pass quickly? The answer comes softly, like a whisper, there is only today. Um, next is Rebecca Everett and then Susanna Ackerman will follow. Rebecca Everett. Well, unlike most of you who met Fran and Ollie or in a critique group, Fran and I met at a yard sale. <laughs> and she invited me to a poetry group. So, <laughs> go figure. But what a blessing it's been. And I was lucky enough to receive in the mail yesterday Fran's very first book of poetry. A rare find, I must say. Blackbirds and other birds. Yeah. So I'm not reciting one of my poems. I am actually reciting one of Fran's poems. For me, this poem speaks to me of how Fran shares her knowledge, her experience, her reading, her writing, her receiving, and her love of poetry. 
This poem also comes from the Reverberations exhibit. The name of the poem is Breath After Breath, and I need to catch mine. <laughs> Moving through water, one arm after the other, alone in this primal world. One with the rhythm of the river, of the sea, of the pulsing womb of life. Here where there is no sound, save the blood pulsing in my body, in my ears. Marking every stroke with intention, with internal knowledge not found in words, but known by the continual wash of water, this rhythmic testimony to life. One with the sweet song of the whale that courses far below in a world that I can only imagine. In those moments, when I hold my breath and lower my whole body into that realm where I no longer need the intake of air to glide, smoothly replenished, by that momentary sense of another world, then rising back into the rhythm of breath after breath of air. Warmed by the sun, I enter yet another atmosphere, feel my arms have become wings, beating slowly. As I move upward through the air that cushions that high flying bird. No need to rest on land. No need to know the stability of rock or earth. Just one with the wind and the slow movement of wing in air. Back in my body, I breathe again the salty spray that signals where I live. My arms moving, stroke after stroke, through water, toward land, always toward home, breath after breath. Fran Claggett. And now, <laughs> and now Susanna Ackerman. <laughs> Susanna Ackerman. So I'm like many of you here, I met Fran only three months ago, and she was gracious enough to invite me to invite this Spanish speaker writing in a second language uh, to Blue Moon uh, Poetry Collective. And my life has been richer ever since, and so has my writing. So, friend, um, this is for all the poems you have chosen to write, for all the poems still left to write, for the way you have nurtured young and old poets and stray immigrant poems, poets like myself. <laughs> and this poem was written for you two weeks ago with immense gratitude for your inspiration and your teaching. The poems you chose to write. Yours is the midnight solitude, the wisdom of animals and stones. Words hidden in cracks of darkness or splendor are yours alone to cavort with the unseen. Like the ravens that perch on the edge of your world, we wait for you to unlock the forgotten words. For your language has feathered birds, rendered the crow the priestess of mystery, split the night into two mornings, so that when our grief meets yours, you rethread the geometry of our yearnings, word by word, 
voicing the cry of a newborn world. Aren't they fabulous? Yeah. So in a, in a minute, we're going to be hearing from our darling friend, or I like, like to say my darling friend. But I have a poem that I wanted to read, and it's not by me. It's by Rebecca Del Rio, and it's called Gratitude. Gratitude means showing up on life's doorstep, love's threshold, dressed in a clown suit, rubber-nosed, gun shoes flapping. Gratitude shows up with arms full of wildflowers, reciting McEwen, or the worst of Neruda. To talk of gratitude is to be the fool in a cynic's world. Gratitude is, a pri is pride's nightmare. The admission of humility before something given without expectation or attachment. Gratitude tears open the shirt of self-importance, scatters buttons across the polished floors of feigned indifference, ignores the obvious, and laughs out loud. Even more, gratitude bares her breasts, rips open her ribs to show the naked heart, the holy heart. What if that sacred heart is not, after all, about sacrifice? Imagine it's about joy, barefoot, and foolhardy, something unasked for, something unearned. What if the beat we hear when we're finally quiet is simply this, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's pretty overwhelming, this day is. And I'm going to begin writing to read to you a poem, another braided poem that Les and I wrote together. This is called, and I have changed my mind. This is called Measuring the Dark. And nobody could ever figure out who wrote what parts of this poem. Neither of us could even go back and say, oh, you wrote that, I wrote that. No. Yeah. <laughs> <It's not. laughs> Measuring the dark. When the heavens empty and stars restless and roaming, is that okay, can you hear me? Okay, restless and roaming, ignite fright. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, it's just stay there. Well, just, yeah, pull the, it up a little bit more. And it'll... Do what? Yeah. There yeah. You go. yeah. Measuring the dark. When the heavens empty and stars restless and roaming, ignite bright white light with no reflection, shimmering the edges, abstractions fall as geometries of attention waver between the mind and the heart. Rendered to a human scale, the perceived universe, like a quarter moon, insists on keeping the mind's minimal light awake through the absence of all it once knew. How do we measure these two bright, two illuminated nights? In our overcrowded, fragile vessel, the dark engendered hard longings of soul. Within our smaller perimeter, the heart's valiant efforts may fizzle and wilt, and yet the pilot light glows warm and steady. I will just read a few. I won't read all these. <laughs> I, I, I would like to, but I will read a few. Um, a field guide to memory. No one else is alive who remembers. The future in the poem is not beholden to the past. Carefully I fill in the dates in April, only one birthday there, but March was busy with birthdays and doctors. And it is March and the poinsettia's red leaves are still hanging, creating a future that may outlast the calendar. Departures from the ordinary, the familiar, prosaic, 
art as technique, predictable as neurons in the hippocampus, move in the direction of tropes, undefined miracles, secrets, myths. Notice the visible quality of silence, drawing the line over the unsaid. End with the image, don't explain. The bird woman stands by the window, dreaming in cloud cover. That was the first time the bird woman appeared in a poem, and I had no idea where she came from. <laughs> However, she keeps coming back. And in that poem, it said, drawing the line over the unsaid. So then here's the next thing that happened when the bird woman came to visit, saying the unsaid. Bird woman returns, stands at the window, waiting. No, she hears, go to the door, open it. Far in the distance, a flash of movement. Then stillness, silence. She turns, sees in the window what lives in the silence, what was always there beside her, his relentless devotion. This poem was really written for my dog, Magic, who was a Saluki that was always at my side. He had a damaged childhood himself. But when he came to, he became relentless in his being by my side. And I didn't know where this poem was going, but Gail Kisson, who's right back there, came up with that word, relentless devotion. And that's what it was. And it got into that poem. Thank you. Don't forget to give me your poems, by the way. I'll read just a couple more. Um, this one I'm reading because Joanne Smith said, this is my very favorite poem and I wish you would read it. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we share an educational background, although Joanne's was much more, she was a superintendent of schools. That used to terrify us. <laughs> <laughs> on marking the mind of a student reading your paper I am struck again or still for I am always reading your paper by the what can I call it by the pure shaft of mind splitting thought into its known but not to be proved smallest particles Reversing the assumption that fission is a disintegrating process. <laughs> Your words set down upon the line in ink on one side only, please, and watch the margins shimmer randomly and bounce against the whiteness of the page. There, no, there. How can I read them when they won't stand still? <laughs> Indicating their presence only by their movement, by their ever-shifting dance upon the lines now wavy to my eyes from trying to follow the optical illusions of your mind. Dance, logos, dance upon the page, my red pen felt tipped irrevocably, suspended above you, not able to violate the poetry of your prose, descending only once to inscribe in that signal, ineffective way, the mark of one mind upon another. <laughs> I have a lot of poems here, but I think I'll just read one more. In this poem, I'm indebted to Les. I'm indebted to every, somebody for every poem I ever write. You know, I use a line from somebody else, or I use an idea that they have expressed. And so this one is called Until. Your story is not my story. Your dog is not my dog. You loved your dog. He was the best dog in your world. I loved my dog. He was the best dog in my world. We grew old. I had to keep living. He wouldn't know what to do without me. I had to keep living so he would keep living. That's how it was. Suddenly he grew old faster. So did I. One day he just laid down and died, as did I. My dog is not your dog, still. Your story is not my story. 
until it is.